Thank you very much. And thank you for your introduction. Uh, well, we can uh, actually take the next slide as you already presented me. Uh, my presentation today is uh, focused around different kinds of pain and uh, also some epidemiology and the bur burden of pain. And we will go through some current pharmacological treatments, the, one we the ones we usually use, and, and also aspects of unmet medical needs. Take the next slide. When it comes to different types of pain, we usually talk about acute or chronic pain. And these are quite simplistic. They're just based on how, how long duration the patient has had uh, his pain, how long time it has been. Uh, acute pain, typical acute pains are, are post-operative pain or post-traumatic pain, which usually subsides when the, the lesion heals. Chronic pain, on the other hand, is pain that has persisted for more than three months. And that's the only definition, which is a bit, uh, could be discussed a lot, because it doesn't say that you have to have pain all the time. It can be some days a week, and it doesn't say anything about the etiology. So we also have, a, uh, we also discuss pain out from a mechanistic point of view, and then we divide it into nociceptive pain, which is caused by lesion or disease, uh, uh, which is due to a lesion that activates nociceptors. Neuropathic pain, on the other hand, is a lesion or disease in the somatosensory system. That means the nervous system. And a new term that has been uh, uh, accepted quite recently is the term nociplastic pain. The typical patient is fibromyalgia or IBS. And uh, here we talk about patients uh, wh who have pain due to an altered nociception, despite clear evidence of nociceptive or neuropathic pain. In the clinic, we see signs of evidence of, of the sensitization of the somatosensory system. And the, as I said, the main patients we see are are the ones we call uh, we call fibromyalgia. Uh, the fourth category is idiopathic pain, which is just a nice word to say that we actually don't know what the cause is, and that's uh, not an unusual mechanistic diagnosis, in, in, at least in the pain center. You can take the next slide. Uh, how common is it to have chronic pain? Well, the one of the biggest and most cited uh, articles is from Harald Breivik in Oslo and his colleagues who published in 2006, where they had telephone interviews with more than 46,000 people in European countries. And they, in this study, they classified chronic pain in adults that had a duration of more than six months, including at least, including the last month and several days a week. And they also rated their pain um, at least five out of 10 on a numeric rating scale. As you see six months here, uh, it is usual that we use six months as a cutoff in, in the clinical trials because some uh, conditions like uh, post-hepatic neuralgia, we see spontaneous recovery. And to, to avoid including patients who have spontaneous recovery during the studies, it's quite common to use this criteria. Well, of course, 20% of the adult population don't seek medical care. M many of these patients, they, they think it's enough to take some paracetamol, uh, or some, some NSAID, not even uh, seeking medical care. But uh, there's a subset of patients that have been defined as having a high impact chronic pain. And in a survey that was published in 2019 from the US, where they looked at more than 15,000 individuals, 
and a pain duration of at least three months and almost every day. Uh, and they classified patients who had at least one limitation in daily activity and, and classified those as high, high impact chronic pain. We can see that 4.8% of the patients uh, had that kind of pain. And in this group of patients, we see, no, uh, we see the ones who seek medical care. I can take the next slide. But that's not the only thing. Uh, chronic pain is costly for society. In a, in, a, uh, in a publication, in a Swedish publication 2003, it was estimated that the cost for moderate to severe chronic pain in Sweden is around 87.5 billion Swedish crowns. And out of that, uh, an overwhelming majority is, is uh, indirect costs and 7.5 direct costs in the healthcare. It is also a frequent reason for seeking medical care. Uh, it's estimated that 20 to 40% of the visits of, to primary care, and around these, like 50% due to chronic pain, and uh, it's also associated, chronic pain is often associated with other diseases. Obviously, pain is a symptom of a disease many times, and they have a background disease. There are lots of comorbidities, psychiatric comorbidities, mainly anxiety and depression. And we have many elderly patients with cardiovascular, neurological, or endocrine diseases. And this has a high impact on the way we can treat these patients, what kind of medications we can use. We can take the next slide. Uh, Didier Boisira in Paris, France, he had, had a publication 2019 where he estimated the prevalence of pain in different neuropathic pain conditions. Uh, Obviously, these conditions are associated with pain, but not all patients actually have chronic pain. But here you can see that quite a substantial amount of the patients with post neuralgia, painful diabetic polyneuropathy, neuropathy related to surgery, MS, spinal cord injury and stroke, have a chronic pain condition. And it it's been estimated in France that the prevalence of neuropathic pain is around 7%. And uh, of that uh, moderate to severe pain with a neuropathic char char characteristic is around 5%. You can take the next slide. Another aspect is that looking at the global burden of disease, this uh, uh, was uh, published in, in Lancet 2012 and has been repeated and uh, uh, with the same kind of results, but I show you here the, the original. And you can see the highlighted white ones with red arrows that are conditions that are usually associated with pain or in the top of these diseases that cause years lost in disability. Low back pain is the world leader. You can take the next slide. And also uh, other aspects of having neuropathic pain. Here is a, a slide that shows the results from a study that was conducted at our center in, in collaboration with the Karolinska. The majority of the patients we had in that study were actually my patients, but it was uh, our PhD student, Anne, Anne Kornström, who was involved from our side. And you can see here that I took the slide with SF36, that uh, there are many aspects of having uh, chronic neuropathic pain. If you look at physical function, physical role, obviously bodily pain, but also general health, vitality, social function, 
role, emotional role, and mental health, they are severely affected. And these patients have a physical role or physical function that is comparable to patients who have a, a chronic heart disease. And a psychiatric uh, uh, pattern that mimics patients who are treated for depression. And that's in the same patient. So this adds difficulty in treatment of, of patients with neuropathic pain. Now we have to be aware that these patients are patients from specialty clinics. So this does not represent all patients with neuropathic pain, but these are the ones we see at special clinics. You can take the next slide. Looking at different types of pharmacological treatments that are used in, in clinical medicine, Obviously, there are other stuff that we use at special specialty clinics, but highly specialized clinics, but I haven't included those because they are just f some few patients. Uh, when it comes to nociceptive pain, we use old, simple analgesics, paracetamol, NSAIDs, usually uh, available from any store. And weak opioids like paracetamol combined with codeine, or in some cases, strong opioids. Neuropathic pain has to be treated in a very different way. Here, uh, even though NSAIDs are the most prescribed medication for neuropathic pain, which is quite alarming, it has no, uh, no effect at all. If, this, if it's a localized pain condition, we can use local treatments like lidocaine patches or capsaicin patches. But the, the mostly used drugs are antidepressants and antiepileptics. Some, I call them mixed opioids, and the example is tramadol having an effect on both the mu receptor and, and also decreasing the reuptake of serotonin, serotonin and, and norepinephrine. And in some uh, selected cases, at least short-term treatment with strong opioids. The big group with patients with nociplastic pain are treated in essentially the same way as patients with neuropathic pain. And that uh, reflects the uh, possible mechanisms of action, meaning uh, sensitization of the somatosensory system, which we can sometimes uh, treat with antidepressants and antiepileptics, sometimes mixed opioids, but strong opioids are not uh, treatment that should be given to these kind of patients. The problem, one of the problems here is that only 30 to 40 percent of, of uh, patients respond to active drug treatment in trials and have at least 50 percent pain relief. If you look at placebo, it's usually around 20 percent leaving the numbers needed to treat in a range of around five to seven. And that's a figure that often is around that we need to treat five to seven patients to get one patient with real pain relief, uh, which can be debated if, but that's the way NNT is, is calculated. Uh, it's important to understand also that non-pharmacological treatment is the first option for neuroplastic pain and sometimes even uh, cases of uh, nociceptive pain. The next slide. What do we need? Well, the first one is actually that we need education and training. The knowledge about uh, pain, uh, pain analysis and pain treatment is not at the level that we would like in the medical community. Uh, it's a small part of the education of doctors and nurses. 
But we also need better treatments. We need higher efficacy. But even more, we need more predictable efficacy. Now it's more like trial and error. We take one of these potential compounds, antidepressants, antiepileptics, or anything, and just try and see if it works. But if, if it doesn't, we try something else. But we need to be able to select patients based on the mechanism of action of the drug and compare that with the, the, the pain-generating mechanism and to try to understand which patient to give what kind of treatment. And for that, we need to find positive predictors for effect. Another important aspect is that mo many of these drugs that we have been, uh, that we are using have CNS-related side effects. And it's a common reason for discontinuation. Feeling dizzy, feeling drowsy, feeling drunk, uh, sedated, and you, you just stop using the medication. Uh, we also need drugs with less risk for addiction. Uh, obviously, any kind of opioid is, is connected to risk for addiction, but also pregabalin and gabapentin, for instance. So what could be done then to, to get to come to this point. Well, other mechanisms of action, obviously, but also it, it would be really important to have the possibility to administer some simple local treatments in the affected pain area, which could be just a hand or a foot or something and not treat the whole patient. In that sense, we could have higher local exposure, low systemic exposure, and increase the chance for energetic effects without the bothersome effects of sedation, drunk, feeling drunk, etc. So that concludes my, my presentation. And the next slide, I guess, is the end slide. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Rolf. Then, Martin.